full screen mode. Okay. Thanks. I'll, uh, I'll kick things off. Um, for those of you that have been to the last few Phoenix meetings, um, last year Anders introduced my talk by saying, uh, hi, this is Rob. A lot of us already know him, and every year he gives a talk on how to break the form compiler, so let's see what he has to say this year. So I thought I'd actually incorporate that into the title of the talk. So uh, I'll be talking about an experimental project, uh, so it's still very much in progress, uh, but I think it's going to be an important idea uh, or a way maybe of moving forward. So let me, let me just get started. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, maybe in terms of uh, the Phoenix project itself and some of the history, and so that might be useful, uh, or at least a review. And then I'll uh, give a brief pictorial history, uh, which it says, so I'll, I'll sum things up. And I'll talk about what I see as one of the core problems or limitations in the tool chain that keeps us from doing more and better things on the finite element technology side. And then I will introduce and give a crash course uh, on what we have done to try to move forward on this. So, there we go. Okay, so thanks to uh, fellow developers, uh, David, Hem, and uh, Michael Lunga, Andreas Kluckner, and Andreas and I have just uh, had a proposal recommended that will, uh, from the National Science Foundation, that will hopefully help push forward some of Phenot and some of the tool chain uh, that's using it. So, uh, in the beginning of the Phoenix project, uh, there's, a, there's a thing called Fiat that still lives down in the guts inside. So, the idea is let there be elements. Uh, we want all kinds of different finite elements. We'd like to be able to declaratively say, here's what a Lagrange element looks like. It's got polynomials of degree k. Here's the degrees of freedom. Go build the basis. And uh, so, or here's the, uh, the, the Ravier Tama element, or the Nedelec element, or Hermit or Argyris, uh, or Morley, or lots of other things that we can describe using the, formula, uh, the, the formalism of the CRLA triple, right? So you have a, an element, in this case they're all triangles, although other shapes are in fact possible. You describe the, um, the polynomial space, and so what space of polynomials uh, is spanned, and you describe the dual space, which are linear functionals um, acting on the polynomials or a higher dimensional space they're embedded in to produce numbers, and those also describe the connectivity patterns of C0 or HDiv or curl or so on. And the key feature uh, mathematically inside a fiat is that if you want to evaluate the so-called nodal basis at some points, say quadrature points, that there exists a matrix V, which is a generalized Vandermonde matrix, that will turn the basis of your choice, say a well-conditioned orthogonal basis, uh, say the Legendre polynomials in 1D or the Dubiner polynomials in 2D or such. And so if you could tabulate those good, the, the easy to compute basis at some points and you had this matrix, there is just some matrix computation you do and then that lets you evaluate the nodal basis. Okay, so, and so that was a very powerful idea. Um, then along came the form compiler where we could, uh, early on, you know, the form language and the form compiler were integrated, but you could somehow write down some notation of grad u star grad v um, and then pipe it through a program and then you get some C++ code that will build the element stiffness matrices and then you can hook it up into, say, Dolphin or the, uh, the finite element library of your choice and that will give you, you know, building a stiffness matrix that you can go off and solve. So these were some of the original and kind of important core technologies that we had uh, that a lot of us have built things off of or relied on to solve our problems through the years. Okay, so now I'll switch. So, so about 2005. Okay, so this is um, th this is this is kind of how I view things. So Anders and I had a conversation in, in Chicago when we were both there, and I told him, "Hey, look, I can generate all kinds of elements using Fiat." And so, okay, great. You know, so so, and there we go. And this is how we all got here today. Uh, a few years later, Anders was on, um, and so I think, and so Marie was uh, was a student working with him at the time, and they said, "We can do div and curl, so why don't we?" And uh, so somehow, um, you know, there was some bad news, and uh, Marie is probably still haunted by uh, by the experience, uh, both of the gutting the form compiler and dealing with some of the internals of Fiat to this day. Uh, but anyway, so uh, so then about the same time, uh, we were realizing that the um, 
that the tensor mode that Anders and I came up with was not always the best way to evaluate the element matrices. And so having some numerical quadrature at runtime was also useful. And so, uh, right, so Christian, you know, had to, had to do some dirty work also with that. Okay, then at various times I've had conversations, uh, Anders and I said, wow, it would just be wonderful if we could stick our Gearus elements in. I mean, Sue Brenner wants them, lots of people want them, and that would just be really powerful because very few codes can do it, right? So, uh, of course, there's the solution. Uh, and then David and I have had conversations uh, that have led to what, we're, what I'll be talking about today. So, uh, you know, he needs to do extruded meshes. I have a very healthy, thank you very much, fascination with Bernstein polynomials. And so, but all of these come back to the same thing. That any time it seems like that we want to make a feature enhancement or include something in our tool chain, that we have to go crack open the form compiler and take everything from essentially UFL down to the code that we generate, although we can still link up against Dolphin, and write a special purpose branch that puts that feature in. So, Another way to, uh, to summarize the problem is that fiat is a tabulator, right? So all that it can possibly do is give back to the form compiler numerical values of basis functions and their derivatives at particular points. So it doesn't communicate anything about, oh, this is the Piola transform. Oh, this is how the Argyris element transforms. Oh, this is that I have a tensor product structure because I'm on an extruded mesh, and here's how you can use that. It just gives back numbers, and once you've lowered to that level, you've lost a lot of information, and it's very hard to build it back in. So, as I've said, we, we don't know how to do, say, um, spectral elements in fiat. It has no, no abstraction for that. Uh, if you have a fast way of building a polynomial or computing, uh, computing moments, like for fast matrix vector products, we can't do those. We can't do pullbacks. So that means that everything that you need to do that's outside of evaluating the basis functions becomes the form compiler's job and gets stuck in. And so if you want to add something, it has to be added in at the level of the form compiler. So every case is special in that sense. Okay, so, okay. Now, uh, so all that's missing from fiat, um, so, so David uh, pointed out this, this quote, so, uh, so any sufficiently complicated, or shall we say non-trivial, C or 4chan, or in fact Python program, contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-written, slow implementation of half of common list. Okay, so, so really the problem is that fiat needs to have an informally specified, bug-written, slow implementation of common list, and then it won't be trivial, or rather, Another way to put it is that fiat is actually trivial <laughs> because it lacks this feature. So, so that's what we need to do, and that's what fiat is going to be about. So, so I'll introduce fiat by saying that fiat is not a tabulator. Okay? Uh, and so we also have a catchy logo for our project, uh, and there you have it at the bottom. So, um, so there, there you have it. So what the idea is is that fiat itself just describes basis functions and it gives numerical values. It has no notion of algorithms. So if it, instead of giving back basis function values, could give abstract syntax, maybe for evaluating basis functions, or if it could give back abstract syntax for evaluating polynomials or performing integration, all of the smarts and all of the special cases that we currently have in place in the form compiler could be pushed down somehow into the element library, and then in the future, a future form compiler could ask Phenot, or in this case, or, you know, it could ask the element library, what's a good algorithm? And then there's a single point of truth about the element for here's how it transforms, here's how it evaluates. And then the point of a form compiler is to take apart the large variational form and then outsource the pieces to Phenot to figure out what the right algorithms are, and then, so we want to describe rather than implement them, and then code generation is, of course, just somebody else's problem. So, so once you have a flashlight battery, you're, you're set, uh, and you can go. So although, in fact, um, you know, we, we might be the somebody else that winds up generating the code, but from the standpoint of software engineering, we have a clear separation there. Okay, so uh, what, what time am I supposed to stop, anyway? 2.15? Okay, so good. So what I'll do is go now and give a brief demonstration of what happens. Okay, so currently 
we have in Phenot, we have. Okay, so currently what we have in Phenot is we've got a lot of. Uh, oh. Okay, so. So, so currently we have a lot of classes describing operations like sums and variables and indices. And then we also have a wrapper layer. Can I make the font larger? Is that, is that useful? Okay, how does one make the font larger? Okay, great. And so what we have is we also have a compatibility layer with fiat so that a fiat finite element it can go and build a fiat finite element and then give you back the kind of plain vanilla recipe that FFC would currently generate. So other than not being hooked up to a form compiler, we have the same functionality actually present, but then I'll show you what it, what it looks like here. Okay, so let me sit, shift enter, yes, okay. And then so what we have is we've currently mooched a lot of things out of fiat uh, just to get started. So we have its reference element and its quadrature rules, although these could be, these could certainly be other things. And then we have a, a phenot indices, a point index. So we have different kinds of indices, just as a mnemonic device to say this index loops over points or basis functions or spatial dimen uh, dimensions. And then we have a set of points, say, um, okay, and then so let's build a finite element in phenot. Okay, so what we have here is two things. We have a phenot Lagrange element, which in this case is a wrapper for the fiat Lagrange element. We also have a coordinate element, which is this thing called a vector finite element. Now, this is something that there's been some discussion about at various times. And currently, inside, or originally inside of fiat, the idea of a vector element is it didn't have any structure at all. It was uh, just um, the Vandermann matrix had a bunch of zeros in it and then blocks on the diagonal. And so it didn't use the fact that there's, it's a, it's a three-fold tensor, or in this, a two-fold tensor product of the element with itself. So somehow we want to be able to capture that. And so this is called coordinate element because when we transform basis functions and reason about pullbacks, um, we need to, you know, we, we will represent the affine map for that in terms of a vector of x, y coordinates, okay? And so we also, uh, we also have an ability to pass around kernel level data for the kernels that we'll build. So we can stuff actual numeric values in it. Okay, so what we'd like to do is just show what does it look like to integrate all of the basis functions against um, against one in this case. So this is a simple moment evaluation or just how do you integrate all of the basis functions. Okay, so um, we have in phenot every finite element is capable uh, of basis tabulation with or without a pullback and with or without various derivatives and it's capable of a polynomial or a field evaluation. So you give me the coefficients of a polynomial and I give you back a recipe for evaluating the uh, polynomial at some points. Okay, so that way you can do some factored algorithms. Uh, and also dual to that is if you give me, say, a, a recipe for the coefficients of a polynomial, I can give you back a recipe for doing the evaluation. So this evaluation uh, and integration things are the things that make spectral elements fast but that live at a higher level of abstraction than just here's the basis values. So, so let's, let's look at this. So here is, uh, here's our recipe that we want to compute. And so, well, so, so let's, take, let's take a look at this. Okay, so every recipe is, well, so it's got, it indicates what the free variables are in here. In this case, I0 is a free variable that runs over the basis functions. And then inside of that, we have an index sum over the quadrature points because we're doing this via numerical quadrature. And this phi naught, which is not to be confused with the library, um, is, a, an, is an array of the fiat generated basis functions tabulated at the quadrature points. So we'll sum over the quadrature points of the ith basis function at the qth quadrature point times the qth quadrature weight. 
Okay, so that's exactly how you would numerically integrate the ith basis function. Okay, so this looks vaguely schemish, but with all of the, the nested parentheses and such. So, so just like scheme, we want to think about, you know, we're pretty printing this, but, but the language is essentially its own AST. Okay, so we um, also, as part of this, it, well, you, you can write an interpreter for it. So if we uh, use the interpreter, we can evaluate and... Right, and so this will give you the values of all of the basis functions integrated at all of the points. Okay, so uh, better sum up to the area of the element. Right, because you're integrating one, and you have a partition of unity. So, so that's that's good. Um, now, also uh, growing out of the Fire Drake project, there's also the the Coffee compiler, which is a compiler that takes loop nests, uh, often resulting from finite elements, and then turns them into efficient vectorized code. Uh, we have a preliminary interface to that, where the coffee, where we can take a phenot AST and turn it, you know, and then lower it into something coffee can read. And so this works too, and if all goes well, at least. I'm assured this will. But I have to be in the right place, and so there you have it. Uh, but you know, I could have just this could just be a shim for that. So you can also look at the the code that it does. Okay, and so here, um, what we have is this this phi. It's an array, and this is about what pops out of fiat. And if you scroll down, here's the quadrature weights that are baked into the code, and here's just a double nested sum. So so we can really do that. Now, um, one of the other, uh, the other neat things in Phenot is, well, in this case, it's just the standard affine pullback, but in the future, we hope to be able to put in other kinds of pullbacks, is you can get a recipe for the pullback that is going to be parametrized over the coordinates, so you can get a formula for doing this integral in terms of the element coordinates. Okay, and so this will put in a recipe. Notice I've got an I1. There is a static cache uh, of the basis function name so that we don't clobber within the same, uh, the same environment. So, okay, so we've got a basis function. And then, well, if you're pulling back this one, all you need is really the determinant uh, because that's just the, the uh, change in measure. Okay, so, but we also have... Um, Let's see. So, so yeah. So we also have this ability to, um, you know, to, to map the geometry and say what are, uh, you know, what are all of the coordinates. Well, here's a formula for what the Jacobian is, right? So it's a recipe. Now it's indexed over uh, spatial dimensions. So J itself is now this two-dimensional array, and you can actually build the Jacobians out of the basis functions. Uh, times the coordinates, and then determinant. Well, we've also got a node in our tree for determinants. Okay, and so there you have it. We can map the geometry to a rule for calculating the determinants. Okay, so now here would be kind of a convection diffusion type operator that if we pull that back, we should get something like this. And let me see. Okay, so I'll, I've got a couple more minutes. And so uh, there you have it. We have this recipe um, where we're, you know, we've got various sums and things. Okay. Now let's take a look here. Vector finite elements. Okay. This is currently something that uh, Phoenix has a difficult time with. Like if you give it an elasticity operator or Navier-Stokes, where each component of your displacement or each component of your velocity and fluids comes from the same space. Really, there's, there's a very nice tensor product there that uh, Phoenix doesn't know how to really utilize at the, at the low level. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with Phenot is be able to reason about this, or at least to express it so that, that a compiler could reason about it. Okay, so now if we are wanting to evaluate one of these vector-valued elements, so now if you look here, this phi2 is just an index into the scalar basis. Okay, so inside of a vector element, what we're doing is we're going to fire up a scalar Lagrange element. 
And we've only got one copy of it, and we don't have a bunch of zeros floating around that later we're going to scratch out. Instead, we have a symbol for the Kronecker delta. So that if your dimension and your basis function index coincide, you'll get a one, otherwise you'll, coincide, uh, otherwise you'll get a zero. Okay, so this is giving you that kind of tensor product structure that hopefully in the future a form compiler will be able to, uh, to make very good use of, both through vectorization, block structure, and such. Okay? So, uh, two things about this. First of all, moment, if you evaluate the basis and then you integrate the basis values against the uh, basis functions, that's the same as building a mass matrix, right? So, uh, so if you have it here, here is, uh, here's a sum. We've got some free indices. Now I've got four free basis function indices. And these basis functions are, instead of looping over the vector finite element, are actually indices over the scalar finite element, okay? So what we have here is within we've got a delta function and we've got uh, essentially a formula for almost a scalar mass matrix with appropriate deltas over it. So, so we're revealing more structure than we would currently get. Okay, so let's see, kernel data, oops. Okay, so we'll load some things up. Um, other things that we allow is, um, so, so instead of say, like um, a vector finite element, you can also have a finite element that's composed of lower dimensional finite elements, right? If you have a quadrilateral element, it's really a, a linear, I'm sorry, a, an element in the x direction times, for some notion of times, an element in the y direction. Currently, fiat can't support that because it doesn't support anything on the quadrilaterals, but its interface doesn't have a way of specifying this tensor product structure. So, uh, that's something we're hoping to be able to do with P not, oh, I didn't, I didn't do the, the one up above it, okay? So here, if we are building a scalar product element of a one-dimensional Lagrange guy with itself, this would be a quadrilateral guy, and then if you're wanting to evaluate the basis at a quadrature point, so here, I14 is really a tensor index that breaks into I12 and I13, and the same thing, Q5 will be a tensor product points index that actually is a cross between Q6 and Q7. And so there you have a natural tensor product evaluation of the basis. Okay, so then now this one will work. Uh, and then you get a formula if you want to, well, if you want to take a gradient, right, you have this separable gradient formula and we can represent that. And since uh, the whole reason for doing this is, no. <laughs> One of our motivations was we don't just want to replicate what's in fiat, but plus maybe add some tensor product and, and vectorization strategies to it. Um, we have very preliminarily, this is, there's still a lot of messes inside for the moment evaluation, but for, uh, at least but for the, um, Sure, we have moment evaluation. The field evaluation we know is correct. Um, but we, have a, we can build a much more complicated recipe out, uh, out of it. But, uh, but this is some of the work I've been doing for Bernstein polynomials. It's actually the optimal complexity algorithm. So waves uh, are expressing a loop carry dependency uh, for all is possibly parallel, et cetera, et cetera. So this is this some kind of sum factored algorithm over the simplex. Okay, so let me move back to the browser and view full screen mode. Okay, so future, future work, well, uh, we need to figure out, we're doing cell integrals and such, we need to put in facets, we need some, some more work on our algorithms, how do we hook this thing up to, uh, to, to FFC and or UFLAX, we've got some preliminary discussions on it, we need to generate some better code and put in a bunch of other stuff. So, I'll stop there, especially since Simone is standing. So.
Yeah, physical or reference. Physical or reference. And then the rest we can do whatever it likes, including not putting that. Right, so if you defined something in physical space, you could just have it, that particular class uh, raise an exception if you asked it to do a reference calculation. You could do the same thing with Bernstein polynomials. They also have a natural physical element or reference element interpretation. You could embed the, uh, you could do the physical uh, space uh, algorithms for Bernstein just as well and not go through a pullback. It's just another, um, as far as Finata is concerned, that's just another dimension, and you've just given it a different name. Uh, so if you had, you could probably express it in Finata, but then if you wanted to generate meaningful code for it, well, that would be an open question. So. Right, there, no, so whether you want to separate them out, like with the method of lines, or, you know, or there might be a code generation or form compiler issue for that. But yeah, in principle, you could have a time dependence for your basis functions in it. So. Could, could you have an option to uh, work with rational I assume so. Uh, we haven't thought about that. Uh, but in principle, we could have all of the arithmetic. You know, it could generate, uh, it could output to, you know, your favorite big num or whatever package. So. Well, just, I mean, yeah. Right, so, so in the fiat layer, that might be a problem since fiat doesn't do rationals, but we could conceivably have another module uh, that maybe it had explicit formulas or Bernstein or something where it worked in rational arithmetic and gave back numbers. I haven't thought about that, though. So, because of quadrilaterals, so, because, yeah, so it's in the quadrilaterals, we don't, yeah. Uh, look, I don't need quadrilaterals, it's fine if you have quadrilaterals. Yeah, we have quadrilaterals as well. Yeah. So, the, the geometry pullback operator can tell whether or not the element is Well, is that, is that, a, that happens in coffee, right, where coffee, is, okay, okay. Okay. So are we, yeah. <laughs> like this, this is experimental, but I think it's got uh, a lot of good mathematical ideas in it and also a lot of opportunities to push things ahead, but it's uh, right now in a very uh, alpha stage, shall we say. Did I, just over, did I just oversell us by saying we're alpha? <laughs> Our next speaker is August Johansson from Similar Research Laboratory, and um, his talk is going to be about high-order cut finer element methods for the Stokes problem using Phoenix multi-mesh features.